There we go. All right. So persuasion, how to set yourself, preset yourself for success. Um, forgot to do one thing. Excuse me real quickly. Make Miss Michelle the co-host. Um, all right. So persuasion, setting yourself up for success. Um, something we've been, we talk about in, in, in NLP in the hypnosis world, you know, the, how you frame things, basically what Caldini did. Um, it's probably why I didn't pay that much attention. He took a lot of what we do and he just, he had it actually really good research and data. I mean, he's a research psychologist. He's, he's brilliant at what he does. He wrote the book a couple of decades ago, um, the psychology of influence, right? Where he, uh, which we'll be taught, I'll be talking about that in a week or so, but it's like, you know, the old, you know, reciprocity had these rules that like, kind of, it synthesized what a lot of people knew, but kind of like what we do in NLP, we, we might know things that work. And what NLP does is, is give it a structure or a framework. And that's what he did with the psychology of influence. And then he started looking at, you know, the really good communicators um, spend more time on setting up how they're going to give the message than the message itself, right? It's how do you frame it? How do you preset it? And it's, you know, and again, I call it, um, excuse me, um, preset yourself for success. And again, everything's happening subconscious. We're aware of that, right? But we don't really guide it, right? And again, like when I taught, you know, hypnotic writing or my persuasion, I would say, why is it hypnotists, and NLPers, peers, even some psychologists understand, uh, you know, the subconscious mind and how all that works? And we'll be brilliant in our sessions and we'll be brilliant doing certain things. But when we go to write an ad or even give a talk, suddenly we default back to almost being like a professor. We're going to give facts and figures and data, right? Which is like, you can just see the people nodding off, right? Or their ads don't work, right? Um, it, it's just what it is. So how do you, what do I mean by preset yourself up for success? I always talk about uh, the, stud, the, the ex experiment that was done where they, uh, walk, it was on a college campus, of course, where it's easier to do these kind of things, uh, but they approached some people and, and um, said they had a hot cup of coffee in their hand, right? And their hands were full, probably with books. And they said like, oh, you know, uh, Carla, would you hold this? And they, for a minute, I got to find, and people are nice. They were, that was one part of the study they talked later is that like more people accepted than, than they, we're really expecting. It's like, yeah, sure. You know, yeah, it'll only take a second. So one group, group A, held a hot cup of coffee for a few moments. Not scalding, but hot enough that you could really feel it. Great. Right. And then that was it. They said thank you and they left. And then a uh, um another group were approached by people and said, you know, with a cold cup, like a soda or something, and said, uh, you know, my hands are full. Can you hold this for a minute? I have to find whatever, my ID, my pass, whatever, right? And so most people say, sure. And they held it. So it was cold. So you had group A, group A hot, group B cold. And then they were approached by another um, person in the research project that said like, oh, hey, uh, uh, we're doing a research project. Will you read this one little paragraph or two little paragraphs? It was very short. Just no more than two or three little paragraphs. Easily on a, not even on a full page. But if you read this and answer three questions, we'll give you $5. It's on a college campus. You know, that's a beer or two. So, you know, people go, sure, I'll do that, right? So they read the, 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 the little story, right? And th whatever their questions were. But what they found were the people that held the hot cup of coffee, right, um, attributed factors to the hero of the little, the little story, if I get it right, was like warm, nurturing, caring, things like that, you know. And then the people that held the cold cup of coffee uh, gave characteristics to the uh, person in the story as cold, aloof, withdrawn. The story was the exact same, you know. It's how they were framed going into the story subconsciously, right? So this is happening all the time. Right. So, you know, they're presetting us up, you know, for success. Right. Or not success. They're presetting us up before they give the message. Right. And so that's 
that's the kind of thing, you know, that, that maybe we could use, right? Um, and Caldini gives the example of a, a consultant that <clears throat> he always had price blowback or price pushback when he would get to the to closing the deal and giving his price for his consulting services, right? And I mean, he tried different things. And one day, just he, like a lot of these things, he just happened to say to the to the prospects he was talking to, you know, now naturally, I'm not going to charge you a million dollars for this. That was just the statement he threw. And then he went on. He says, you know, my consulting fee is seventy five thousand dollars, right? And his pushback went down like 90%, right? And it was the subconscious, you know, and, and Caldini's got the research. It's like, if you think about it, it's like, you know, if I, if they, if he presented some really cool stuff, it looks like it would get the results, right? And then in, just by mentioning a million dollars, which in, you know, this was in the C-suite, so that would be a real number, you know, it wouldn't be what most people would think of, right? So a million dollars and then say, well, here's my fee and it's down here. Um, it sets it as more reasonable, right? And then they people didn't ask for discounts. They either bought or not bought. That's what I think they said the biggest thing was, right? Either buy or not buy. Don't try to, you know, which, you know, I, I much prefer that when I'm pitching something to somebody, either buy it or don't die. Don't start the, can, you know, that's... Uh, so anyway, it's kind of interesting. So when you talk about persuasion, you know, it's setting the frame, you know, and that that we can control, right, with our messaging. And this seems to, a lot of this stuff, I heard uh, supposedly he's working on a, uh, it might be a book or whatever he's doing, but he's talking about how to use all this stuff even more specifically in social media and in the, in, in the new world. Um, so anyway, so let's talk about ways to do this. So when you talk about persuasion, what do you have to do to set the frame? Well, first of all, you have to get someone's attention, right? And we keep, you know, they keep telling us how our attention span is dropping, right? It gets less and less to, to just seconds now, okay? People are scrolling. How do you get them to stop, right? So how do you get um, someone to focus on your message. That's first of all, right? The, mo the, 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 the message, right? And it, you know, he, they talk about how, what's, what's interesting when you look at this, how, they, how, how you can, how someone can guide your attention, we would say subconsciously or pre-consciously, right? And it's like, there's always that argument, does the media set the agenda? And what Caldini would say, that was kind of interesting, it sets what you're paying attention to, right? Which again, will slant your, how you're looking at things, right? Um, and if it draws attention to it, then you'll think about it, right? And if you do it well enough, you can create things, you know? You can create a market, you know? Um, make things more important. Attention equals importance, right? And there's a saying, which is, nothing is as important as you think it is while you're thinking about it, right? But once you start thinking about it, it shuts down your, you, know, you start focusing on that, right? And, you know, we see it in the micro world with politics, with, with everything that's going on, you know, it's what you're paying attention to. And you're going to say, this is very important. Then you'll assume it's important to everybody. And maybe not, right? But what if it brings your attention to something that's not a problem, but it's framed as a problem. And then you create the solution. You know, the example I would use is shave club for men or dollar, whatever that thing is, you know, because basically it's almost like we know how hard it is to buy a razor. I remember when I first heard it, I'm like, I go pre COVID. I'm like, I don't know, grocery stores, drug stores, Walmart, Jesus Christ, gas stations. I don't think it's that goddamn hard to buy a shaver. You know, but then you start thinking about it. And then, you know, what about that time you're, you didn't have a new shave, uh, a razor, and you needed to shave that day, you know, for a business meeting or a date or something. So then they like focus your attention on it, bring up a problem, and you'll start thinking like, yeah, that's happened, right? Or whatever. 
Uh, and wouldn't it be nice to just have the razors delivered to your door? Okay. And that and that one actually started even before all this, you know, before COVID hit and you know the whole Amazon explosion of everything gets delivered to your door. Right. And so, you know, they brought attention to a problem, right? And, and then amplified the problem and then gave their solution. And so, you know, multi-million dollar business. So just think about, you know, so you got to get people's attention because it, it focuses them down on what you're doing, right? Um, and this is important because... You can, you can change someone's thinking, right? And again, if you bring up it, the problem, you get their attention on it, it's like, have this ever happened to you, right? And then, it, and again, it's, it, it works really well, especially for media, right? Which is, you're targeting certain, you're not targeting, you know, what is it that all the marketers say, if you tar and I'm guilty of this, you try to target everybody, you're hitting nobody, right? So like that shave club for men, of course, it's men, uh, I don't know if they have a women's division, uh, but I don't use their products, but it's like, yeah, Billy's shaved your head, right? Uh, but it, you know, it, it, that's his target, right? And then he, if it gets your attention, like what's this, you know, and they had some cool ads, right? And it only points out the positives of having it delivered, you know, changes direction, right? How much easier would it be if like once a month or what? I think it's, I don't know. I, I don't use their service, but it's like, you know, and I think what the guy did from, from what I heard, I looked him up. It's like, he saw like the people that get into these uh, gourmet wine clubs or the gourmet beer things, right? That, yeah, you could, you could run to the liquor store or the, or the wine shop and buy this, but wouldn't it be easier to get it at home? Right. And it's like, Oh, yeah, it would be, right? Uh, so, you know, and just by pointing out the positives of what you're offering them, don't mention, and he would argue in the, the way I read the book, which was like, don't even, you know, mention, mention um, necessarily the competition. Point out how, well, just how yours does things, right? And then I know someone else that does, does this kind of stuff said the problem with, you know, somebody, no, no, no. You say like, here's the positives of ours, here's the negatives of theirs. Well, then that's going to bring in the analytical factor of, well, yeah, but what about, you know, like the iPhone will do all this wonderful stuff that maybe this phone won't do. But then some people go, I'm not going to use 90% of the stuff that's on this phone. I mean, anybody else ever have that experience with their phone? I mean, it's, you know, I was shocked when I found out some of the things it would do, and I've got an i10. Um, so anyway, so it's basically changing the direction of how the person is thinking, right? So the first way, you know, you, you set the frame is by getting their attention, right? And of course, um, what always gets attention, you know, an attention grabber still works, you know, which is sex, danger, or a threat, or total novelty, Total novelty, right? Something that's just, that'll get your attention, okay? Um, there was a girl on that call I was on the other day and she was talking about the ad or the, the post she put up and turned it into an ad that like basically blew up her business was she filmed her brother sitting on a toilet. I know what you're doing as you're scrolling. You're probably pooping. And people would stop because there's a guy sitting there on the toilet with a newspaper, right? And then, uh, you know, it was like, uh, kind of, it would, it would it get your attention, right? Of course, I'm like, does this work? So I went in my bathroom, filmed, there's my toilet, you know, and then I said, here, I'm in the bathroom. What, is, what does the bathroom have to do with controlling your drinking? I don't know. Have you ever closed the door and cried because you screwed up your life due to your drinking? I'm going after a target market, right? Uh, so anyway, you could do all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, you grab their attention and those, those classics still work, you know, um, and how can you use that, right? Bring out the problem, focus their attention on the problem, 
you know, you don't even really have to rub salt in the wound, but you focus their attention on if they have the problem, which is for what we do, I think brilliant because if they don't, you're not trying to solve their problem. So, you know, it's going to move on, right? Um, so you, you focus their attention and then you can always use whatever those, the classics are, right? Sex, danger, or novelty, you know? And does novelty work, right? Well, some of those YouTube guys that do that crazy shit, like blow up cars and do all this, like they're making $50 million a year off YouTube. And they constant, it's getting harder. And one of those guys was talking about how hard it is even for him with this list of whatever it is, a hundred million followers, right? To get someone's attention. But we're going after a target market, right? So again, you could you could do some novelty, use the classics, right? The other thing that we all know is um, targeted questions, right? Right? What are some of the targeted questions? You know, that will focus attention. You know. Are you a man over 50 having trouble keeping the weight off? Again, you know, people are going to, if you're in that group, you're, it might get your attention. You see the question, you might stop, you might read the post, which is all you're trying to do for what, what we're talking about, right? Targeted questions. You know, they talk about a study done, I think it was in Canada, hey? I you know that's overused. But it was where they asked people, you know, a control group was, the group, one group was, are you happy with your social life? Second group was asked, are you unhappy with your social life? Right? And the people that were asked the unhappy question pointed out more negatives, 300 and something percent more than, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's just the tart, you know, it a question is, you know, our dear friend, Tony Robbins would say, it's the questions you ask that guide your mind, right? You know, so, you know, so what are some of the questions you could ask, right? Right, and then, so you're, you're, these are the first two for your uh, attention grabber, you know, or your, to set the frame, right? So you get their attention, you target, now you got to hold their attention. This is the hard part. Right? Hold their attention. Right? And the easiest way, according to Caldini and some of the people that study this, is you constantly talk about them. You. you know, it's the old, as my other friend Scott McFall would say, you know, if your name is mentioned more than once, it's a terrible goddamn ad. <laughs> yeah. It's not about you. It's about, you know, um, so, so you want to talk about them, you know? And again, you can use it by telling stories. So, the old saying is still true. You know, facts tell, but stories sell. You know, are you an overweight? Are you a, are you a male over 50s having trouble keeping the weight off when you never had that problem before? Let me tell you about my client, Bree. He had this issue, da, 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 and then he joined whatever it is I'm going to try to sell him. And this is what Reed says, da, 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 da. that gets their attention in your target market. Everyone else will go, that's not me. They're not going to pay attention, right? Um, and I, I'm sure we've all done that. You know, we've all clicked on ads that like, you don't even know who you're, who it is yet, right? Which brings up, by the way, a side question of if you're going to do this for branding, Right? Are you branding you or the or your product? Huh? You are the product. Of course, the, the advantage to framing you as the product, you know, then it's you. The downside is you can never sell the business. Right? Because once you leave, the business goes away. Um, my friend, Scott McFall, who was trained by a guy named Russell Yarnell, 
You know, he said, if you're going to run a hypnosis clinic, you, no one should know who owns the place. Right? Because then you could sell it. Because if you don't, you know, if it's Michelle's, you know, if her name's all over, her picture's all over, and somebody shows up for a hypnosis session, I want Michelle. Well, Michelle's busy. We're going to give you a great therapist, uh, Bruce. No, no, I want Michelle or nobody. Right? And I'm seeing this in the real world, right, where a couple people we know, which they branded it, and they have all these coaches. And uh, many people won't, won't, don't want to sign up unless they can work with the person they see on the ad every day. Right. And but it could work. He's he's spinning it brilliantly because to work for him is mucho dinero, as they say, you know. And he could say, well, why don't you start with one of my key um, key coaches, Danea, and then then if you still want more help, you know, I'll still be here. Right. And again, it's that framing of, well, if you work with me, it's twenty five thousand dollars for us to start. You know, but, you know, Danea, whatever it is, five grand to start the product. Same program. She's basically going to teach what I teach, right? So it frames it differently, right? And then for that person, it's a win-win, if you think about it, because then, no, no, I'll pay you. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I'll take the money, you know? Um, so whatever it is, right? So you got to hold their attention by talking about them, you, give client stories, right? Client stories. Testimonials, of course. And the reason I like teaching this, as I always say, a lot of this stuff is, is me search because I'll teach this, then I'll catch myself not doing it 90% of the time. You know, I was at one of the little conferences and somebody here, they're great at social media, right? And you see their posts all, and they go, except when I'm at a goddamn conference, I forget, you know? And now I got all these people. I could be, you know, photo bombing. I could be, a, you know, and I'm like, okay, so I'm not alone. Right. Right. And so. So we want to do that. Right. We want to hold their attention. Right? And the way and then you want to also get into, as uh, Caldini pointed out, he added a level to his, to his uh, six levels of influence, which is unity. Right. You know, I've said for years, you know, if you want. To create something, you encourage their dreams, justify their failures, confirm their suspicions, allay their fears, and create a common enemy. Right? The last two of those, allaying their fears and create a common enemy, is all about unity, right? A group. No? Because if you're part of a group, it becomes your group. If you're a member of a church and you're active, you don't talk about generally the church, you talk about my church, our church. Right. If you're a sports fan and you and the team loses, you never say, well, the Raiders lost. You'd say, I lost. Were you were you on the field? No. Then you really had nothing to do with the outcome. Right. But if it if you're into it, so you know, you got groups, um, you know, and it said shared experience and of course family. Right? Family being the ultimate group. Right? Join our family. You know, the click funnels family. And that's it works. We all want to be part of that. We seek unity, right? And it's all about again making those connections. You know, again, we would call it anchoring. Caldini calls it connection. What are you what are you connecting in people's heads? Right. And you're you're doing it whether you want to or not. Okay, so what is what is anchored in people's minds? Right. One thing I brought back, because people go, what happened? Right. Which is I'm start do all these posts from the barn with the horses. You no. Know? Well, you're the horse guy. Yeah, we got, yeah. I just I was doing it because the way it was set up at the time, I was constantly out there while I, honestly, while I was shoveling horse shit, I would be, you know, take a break and do a post, right? And it I, and again, I forgot how effective it was, right? And actually, the horses were the star of the show, right? But it got attention, right? And my evidence for that is I'll be at a conference. People ask me how the horses are. People I don't know. How's Chicago? How's Miss Penny? 
right? So it's kind of interesting. You know, it's like that study that, uh, not study, but they were interviewing these people, went to one of the big business schools, Wharton, one of the big, huge business schools. And they're asking graduates of the MBA program, which is, you know, hey, you know, it's a big deal, right? Of all the professors they had, you know, who is their favorite? And they got different professors, right? But the one that had the most, they said, I don't know if they were my favorite professor, but I always remember whoever it was, Professor X, because he always wore red Converse sneakers with his suits, because they wore suits there, but he always wore those sneakers, right? It was novelty. It's kind of tying it in what we're talking about. It was novelty. It was different, right? And it, it lasted. It was a connection in their mind, right? So what, what, what do you want to do? And of course, I think what we want to do if we're using this in therapeutic messages or sales is it's about trust. How do you develop trust? How can you make that connection of trust? If you haven't read the book, Caldini does a really cool, he, it wasn't him. He was, one thing he did is he went and he would hang out with all these salesmen, you know? And uh, he, uh, the salesman, it was, I think, selling fire alarms or something, but he had a preset proposal. You know, they had a routine they would go through. The only thing he did different, he was their best salesman, was he would, um, in the middle of the presentation, as they're reading something or doing something, he would go, oh man, I forgot something. I don't want to interrupt you. Is it okay if I let myself, they're in the living room. Is it okay if I let myself out and get this out of my car? I'll be right back. And almost all said, sure, right? They're in the middle of doing something. So they're doing it, you know, and there's the door. A couple of people walk them there, right? And then they generally go, let yourself back in. Who do you let in and out of your house? A stranger you don't, you've just met generally? No. Someone you trust, a family member, a friend. Right? Uh, so, so yeah, so, you know, and this is what we want to go for. You know, and the way you do that is with connection. I'm like you. you know? if you have, if you had the problem and you solved it, it's easier to follow, right? That builds some trust, some credibility. And of course, testimonials build trust and credibility and all that. So, you know, it's all about that attention, unity, and connection. So that's kind of a brief overview, right? I'm going to break these down later. Um, and in the inner circle, we're going to workshop how to do this stuff. So that is the, I'm, not, I'm still recording, but I'm going to gallery. Any questions? Oh, the name of the book somebody just put up is Persuasion by Robert Caldini. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a good book. And half of it, you'll be going, I know that. Why am I doing it? Especially those of us trained in the hypnotic arts, the mind sciences. You'll be going like, why did not? why did I, you know, you know it, you're not doing it. Okay. And so any questions, I'll stop the recording. Okay, hold on. Let me stop. Doo -doo. That's just a little bit on persuasion, you know, as we'd say in NLP, setting the frame, anchoring, some of the ways to do this. If you want more information on June 27th, which is a Tuesday at 12 noon, uh, good Lord willing, and as they say, the creek don't rise, um, there'll be a live two-hour, three-hour training on persuasion, and part of that will be helping people uh, um, how to, like, use this to hone your message own your message. So if you want any information, click on the link below. I'll see you soon.